Hey, Jeff. Hey, Eric. How are you? I'm pretty good. How are you? Doing well, thank you. Actually, let's do it again. All right. Hey, Jeff. Hey, Eric. How are you? I'm fucking fantastic. How are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm fantastic as well. Thank you. I was looking at our numbers today, and I don't spend an awful lot of time looking at our numbers, right. but I felt like I wanted to see how our podcast was performing, and our plays per week, Yeah, we're getting... As many now in one week as it used to take us a month to do. That's crazy. Last year. And our biggest audience is obviously in New York. Right. Our top three markets, according to SoundCloud, are the Bronx, yeah. Manhattan, and Brooklyn. Shout out to all of them. And no shout out to Queens or Staten Island, I guess. I, none. Yeah. Like, if you're living in Staten Island, do not talk to me. I am very on board with Manhattan and Brooklyn and the Bronx, though. Just be clear. And, you know... There are places in Queens and Staten Island. Top three only. Top three only. We're we're drawing a line. Yes. But I do want to say um, we want to shout out a bunch of people from New York. We put out a call to everybody on Twitter who wanted a shout out for this episode that we're putting out tonight. So we said, hey, you want to get shouted out? Pay us $5. We got to make money somehow. And here are the shout outs to all of our friends who responded. Shout out to Varun Shetty. MP Trey, Sierra Raquel, your man Sean, all of our friends at the World Famous Forecast. Shout out to Top 2 Lindo on Instagram. Nikki Chulo, who's been bodying your favorite pieces of album art for a while now. Shout out to July Diaz. This is a shout out to the Statue of Liberty. Sure, shout out to... I'm not, G- no, I'm not shouting out the Statue of Liberty. I'm shouting out to July Diaz. Shout out to Jeff Meltz of The Culture of Me. Shout out to Second and Gunny up there in the Bronx. JD Tominski from Def Jam. Wesley Ring from the Upper East Side. Shout out to fuck the Upper East Side. Shout out to Sky Trilly who said, awesome purchase ladies are throwing the music networking event on Wednesday that you want to be at. This is not only artists, but also anyone who supports them in business. Come have a drink, make friends, and join in on an open conversation about dreams, goals, and work that goes into making those dreams a reality. That's at the Spread House Cafe in New York City. Go check that out. Shout out to Sky Trilly. Also, shout out to Steven from New Jersey who says that he wants to give his shout out to Amaris Jones, who is the world class chef behind Rick Ross's kitchen in Miami. Shout out to Ben Rosen from Hypebeast and to Johnny up here on the Upper West Side. Shout out to productive Ray Rodriguez and our friend Hawaii Mike. Chris B06 and Christoph, Grandmaster Henny up in the Bronx. Indigo Ugly and Captain Skinny Fat. Yes. We salute Captain Skinny Fat. Once again, we wanted to shout out everybody from Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Bronx specifically. And you know what? Here's a little shout out to all of our friends in Queens and Staten Island and the surrounding areas like Westchester and New Jersey and Connecticut and anywhere who commutes into the city. Actually, also, we got some shout outs to do from Funny Julius. I want to shout out Katie McGuigs. I want to shout out Kimmy Cakes. And all that to say... All of you in New York City, since you support us so much, since you tune in every week, we hope that you're going to be at our live show this Wednesday at SOBs. It's a live podcast called It's The Real 2 SOBs, and tickets are on sale right now at itsthereal.com. It's going to be a fun night. Everyone knows our track record, so come through. Doors are at 7. The show is going to start promptly at 8 o'clock, so leave your job and leave your worries and come hang out with us. It's going to be a great time this Wednesday, January 10th. It's the real 2 SOBs. It's the real.com. Today on the podcast, we have... Alex Chichamaro, the bald god. The bald god that makes this the bald pod. We talk about a whole bunch of stuff with Alex who grew up in Brooklyn. We talk about his parents' van being stolen on a weekly basis. We talk about him being a 10-year-old calling up Bad Boy Records because he thinks that that is how he's going to get a record deal. We talk about getting into music management as a teenager, dedicating himself to the idea of working in the record business, and simultaneously just giving up on high school. We talk about him going down to Walt Disney World and working at a store called Once Upon a Toy, and eventually building up a resume through digital marketing relationships with the hip-hop blogging universe. We talk about Al Lindstrom and Sirius Satellite Radio with Tony Touch and Stag Selecta. He does an amazing Stag Selecta impression. We talk about hanging out in the studio with Just Blaze, road managing 2-9 around the South, going to our friend Fadia Cater's broken bougie parties down there in Atlanta. We talk about spending his last money to catch the last flight back to Brooklyn to do digital marketing for Rich Homie Kwan and turning that into a record label career working at Atlantic Records with all your favorites like Gucci and Cardi and Kodak and PNB Rock and Meek Mill and Jill Scott before going to Universal Republic and for the first time ever Alex talks about his latest venture which he gets into 
today. All that good stuff. Shout out to Alex Chichamaro, the bald god. Hopefully you guys go and follow him because he really is a wealth of knowledge and you guys should follow him on Twitter at the bald god. Shout out to Alex, shout out to Shamira, shout out to Sophia. Jeff, when do you want to get into this? Uh, right now. Yo, what up? It's Eric, a.k.a. Taxidermy, a.k.a. Keeping it a buck. Yo, what up? It's Jeff, a.k.a. Get Down, Lay Down, a.k.a. Yoga Mat Fast Down. Yo. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's Alex, and I'm so happy about this part. Oh, my God. Amazing! <laughs> yeah, this is what he's telling me. This is the wheel. <laughs> you got to, like, incorporate flex bars. By the way, you guys were so shook when I said Matt Fast. Oh, that was the best. Yeah. That was the best. Do you pre-write those? That was off the dome. Alex, I mean, we know this, but you're originally from? Brooklyn. Where in Brooklyn? Park Slope. Well, I was born when I was, like, until 10, I was at a place called Windsor Terrace. Oh, so you're already lying on the podcast? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm, you know, these are all new revelations. <laughs> No, I grew up in a place called Windsor Terrace, which is like basically fucking Park Slope. It's okay. like literally like it, ten a, blocks away. Yeah, it's like, but it's a tiny, tiny. It's so small. I don't even think there's How a train small station. Is it? It's a, uh, it's, <laughs> it's right by the, um, the park. It is. I lived like two. I always lived like five blocks away at Max from right. Park, Prospect Park. What, what was your train of choice? Well, I was 10, so my train of choice was, like, the stroller. Yeah. You know, I just get pushed around. Until you were 10? Yeah. You know, I, I'm still doing that now. Well, that that's true. Now you're the one pushing it. Nah, I move the baby out the way. I say, hey, Shamira, please. Please, I'm working too hard. But what's growing up in Park Slope like? Um. Well, now it's different. But yeah, what, it, what was it yeah. like? I mean, it wasn't – it's not super different. Like, when I was growing up, I guess it was a – you know – it was a little bit more Brooklyn, I guess you could call it. Like, there was, like, you know, everything was a corner store. Everything was, like, local mom and pop stuff. It's kind of like how Bay Ridge is now. Mm -hmm. As I was growing up, I lived between 5th and 6th Avenue. And then, like, above 6th Avenue, 7th, 8th, closer to the park. That's when it was, like, everything changed. Like, I remember Barnes & Noble came. And the next week, like, every other store was, like barnes and noble-esque yeah and then like yeah like seventh avenue got bought up and then fifth avenue got bought up and fourth avenue got bought up and you know and here we are living in gentrified uh i mean yeah i feel like park slope was like the first gentrified area in brooklyn probably like i think when my parent when my parents they bought the house god mm -hmm. bless yeah, yeah so like when they bought the house it was like the 80s and it was like super cheap and like before i was born you weren't supposed to live anywhere below 7th avenue and like there was all this. but like does that mean they had the foresight they were just like yo we know that like yeah i mean the tide's gonna turn did they know barnes and or noble yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they got the call from yeah. noble <laughs> from billy j noble like yo my god <laughs> By now. <laughs> well, my dad grew up in Brooklyn. My dad grew up in Windsor Terrace. The house that we lived in was his parents' house. He Whoa. bought it from them. Whoa. So, yeah. So, he knew Brooklyn, like, his whole life since, like, the freaking 50s. Or yeah, 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 yeah. So, I think he just knew, like, Park Slope was up and coming, and he saw it, and he, he's a smart guy. Yeah. So, he bought the house. But, like, yeah, it was at a time when... It still was a little weird because it was still Brooklyn. But, like, you know, by the time I was born and all that stuff was happening, it most people were, like, coming in. They were buying up the brownstones. It went from, like... I The earliest I remember knowing how much a house costed was, like, when I was, like, 15. So, like, 2004. Yeah. And, like... Like the house was like a million dollars at that point. Like, Damn! If you lived by the park, it was like a ten million dollars. Did Jay Z own it? <laughs> Yo, Jay Z. So fucking five sixty State Street. Yeah, it's literally like fifteen blocks from me. Mm -hmm. And I never knew. Like song comes out, there's the bar in it, and I had no clue that five sixty State Street was so close. <laughs> and I'm with Al Lindstrom, and we're in the cab or something coming over the Manhattan Bridge and he goes yo you see 560 State Street right there that's what they were talking about so I always thought that was cool so I started dating Shamira and we would always be drunk and taking <laughs> cabs home and I would always take the cab back to the house 
and drive over. And every single time I would go to her because I'd forget I told her the last time. <laughs> you were drunk. And I was like, I was like, yo, you know that Jay Z song? <laughs> And she'd be like, yeah, you told me this 20 times ago. <laughs> um, so now it's like a running joke with us. When you were, when you turned 16, did you get your driver's license? Did I get my driver's license? Yeah. Did I tell you the story? No. 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 I failed that driver's test like fucking 20 times. <laughs> I had to go. Were to you like, drunk? <laughs> <laughs> nah. I, um, the first time I thought I had it and then I took it all in Red Hook. Mm-hmm. And the first Big time, mistake. yo, it is <laughs> secret to kids. If you go to Staten Island, they do not give a shit. As long as you can sit in the car in Staten Island, <laughs> they were like, yo, <laughs> you can drive. <laughs> no, in Red Hook. So I drove the first time I did it, I was driving and like my back wheel touched the double yellow line or some shit. Automatic fail. Damn. I was pissed. Sure. Second time I get in the car, so nervous that i forgot you know like the park drive thing and i forgot like <laughs> how to maneuver how to make the blinkers work so i'm sitting there the guy gets in i'm freaking out i'm like all right shit so i hit the fucking what i think is the blinker to signal that i'm gonna make a turn but it was the windshield wipers <laughs> so the windshield wipers are going and i'm like oh no he's like all right just calm down just hit the blinker i'm like all right cool i switch it and then i forgot that i had uh, put the car in reverse. So I hit the gas. <laughs> the car goes in reverse. I almost hit the car parked behind me. I'm like, oh, fuck. You are... Automatic fail. Like he I gave, mean, yes, automatic He fail. let me circle the block, though, just to be like, <laughs> yo. You, you went you're all the way nice to Red kid. Hook. <laughs> you're a nice kid. And but, then I found out the Staten Island thing. Got my but life. you're living in Brooklyn. I mean, there's not, like, a lot of opportunities for you to drive, are there? Or, no, or my, were you stealing cars and you were just like, oh, I need to move these to you know, the like chop my, shop? My pa- <laughs> so, first off, my parents, like, friends would tell me that that's how they learned how to drive. Like, every single one of them. I'd be like, yo, what was... <laughs> What was going on in your life? <laughs> like they were living above uh, Seventh Avenue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like fucking nah. Like my grandma had a car. Mm-hmm. My parents had like this van that got stolen every week. Bye. It was, like, it, nobody knew, but it, they would because the car was so shitty. It would be returned in a week. <laughs> like it would get like full on like jacked. They do some weird shit. I think they were like transporting like. Dead bodies or drugs. I, I want to make a sound cooler. Yeah, sure, yeah, 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 I yeah, do. Yeah. And then like in a week, like it was a van. Like it was like a it green was Dodge Caravan. <laughs> it was just back. Nothing was stolen out of it because it was such a piece of shit. And like we just were like, oh, we gotta take this back. We gotta go. Now we gotta worry about alternate side parking again. Right. Oh. <laughs> it was so terrible. So in high school, what, is music a part of your life at all? I mean, yeah, music was a part of my life before. Like, when I was, like, 10, I wanted to be a rapper. You did? Yeah. What was your name? I didn't have a rap name. I didn't get that far. Oh, did you you have bars? No, (laughs) I didn't even get that far. I thought, like, record labels, because this was at, like, the time, like, Rockefeller was big, Bad Boy was big, all this stuff. I thought, like, labels were, like, sports teams, and I thought, like, you could apply for some reason. So I call. I remember just calling like Bad Boy a lot and being like, "Hey, can I apply to be a rapper on your record label?" And they said, "And yeah, they what put, did Puff say?" Yeah. <laughs> Can't fuck that shit. Nah. Go get some cheesecake. No, he um, you didn't get drafted. Nah, there was like some automated message about like submitting a demo. I didn't know what a demo was, but I knew like I was not gonna ever be a rapper, so I never even like tried that. Damn, real. dreams dying early. <laughs> yeah, I gave up on that. I'm actually reading a book right now about it. They call this growth hacking now. Instead of just giving up, it's called finding the quickest path to getting something done. Oh, that's so I'm, I was basically, if you ask this book, like a child genius. Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I just want to let you know <laughs> you're in the presence of a child genius. Listen, we, we knew that. Nah, I mean, from there, I was like, I was trying to do stuff. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Yeah. Like, I always wanted to do something in music. By the time I was like, in high school, yeah, like, I basically, so, this kid that I knew, this was, like, Jay-Z, Cameron, are in the middle, of like, this crazy beef, and, like, my heart is broken, <laughs> and we were big on, like, these message boards, like, I used to go on Boxden all the time, I don't yeah. know if you're familiar with Boxden. Sure, yeah, sure. So, like, 
something happened. He made this like Jay, like they made this whole like clipped up thing of all the lines that Jay Z had stolen from Biggie. Yep. Yeah. So my friend, because we're from Brooklyn, did one about the lines that Cameron st- and Dipset had stolen from all these other people. And, like, now rap internet was really small then. It was, like, Boxton and SOHH and, yep. like, the all hip hop yeah. arms and shit like that. So, like, it went viral, like, because Miss Info posted it on her MySpace page. This mm-hmm. is when she just had a MySpace page. <laughs> I know you guys are all friends, so like we were yeah, in the yeah, top yeah. eight. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you were? <laughs> yeah. No. no. <laughs> so like he was talking to her, and then like somebody played it on Hot ninety seven. People thought. I remember I went to high school, and like people thought that Jay Z had done that, and like I was like, oh shit, this is amazing. You're like, I I did make it to Rockefeller, like, <laughs> but I didn't do any of this. He did it all, and like he just knew that like I was hyped up about it, so he was like. Oh, you want to be my manager? And I was like, yeah, I want to be your manager. By the way, this kid had no career. <laughs> yeah. He made one thing. The, but rev- like- the revenue stream, though, was crazy. <laughs> You're yeah. like, I'm going to call bad boy. <laughs> <laughs> so, apply. Some, yeah, yeah, submit this like link. <laughs> so he um that night, some guy, I think it was somebody, because there was, because Team On Smash was a thing at that time, and they were, like, posting records on, like, all the message boards. And he had met somebody affiliated with Team On Smash. They put him on, like, this, like, radio conference call or some shit. And, like, at the time, I didn't know. So I get on it. I get a- First off, <laughs> if you've ever been on one of these things, it's literally just the artist answering random questions from DJs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what Young Sav and Steve-O yeah. used to do at Def Jam. And- but, like, this was, like, a thing. They've been doing this for forever. But I think Sav and Steve-O were really smart. And they were like, oh, all of these, like, bloggers. And I feel like Sav and Steve-O understood rap internet before a lot of people. They sure yeah. did. And, like, knew, hey, if we get Rick Ross to talk with, you know, X, Y, and Z blogger, that's the same as him talking to a DJ. We need to feed them. So, anyways... This is when all DJs were on there, and Paul Wall was on the call, and like I was just so like hyped up that I was on the phone. And you Paul were on the Wall Paul Wall call. On, I was on the Paul Wall call. Yeah, and I, I don't know what song he was talking about, but I was just so excited. And then I was like, next day I bought the Donald Passman book, and I was like, I'm in the music business now. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna negotiate publishing deals. Well, what happened to your What happened to your client? <laughs> oh, I went to his house. Actually, I went to his house the next day. I'm like, we got to do mixtapes like this. You're going to like, you do all this stuff. We'll do all these edits and make beats and stuff. And he was just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then he went and was like, I don't know, fucking some girl. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, that. yeah. And that was it. Oh, good and for him. It always, it, it always worked out for him. Like yeah. That. You know what I mean? Wait, so, so, okay, you have these, these, Big dreams in your head now of working in the music business. Yeah. How do you continue that? First was I basically gave up on high school. <laughs> gave up. Smart man. It was just, you know, You're child a- genius. <laughs> yeah, growth hacking. Yeah. I just, it was just like, this shit is whack. Like, I literally, like, I remember, I mean, I went to high school. I finished high school. I got my No, d- don't say it like diploma. that. <laughs> no. But, like, it was, like, all with, like, 65s and, like, my dad yelling at me and kicking me out of the house all the time because I was, like, not good at, like, doing shit. You know what I mean? Well, like, did you explain to him? Like, what, I was growth yeah. hacking at that yeah. time. <laughs> nah, he wasn't really hearing that. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I go, like, hang out at my friend's house. Anyways. You're um, like, you know how you bought the house before the area, yeah. like, caught up? <laughs> That's me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really have, like, the intelligence to have that conversation at that time. I was wearing, like, 5X t-shirts and, like... The baggiest jeans possible. And by the way, this was at a time when, like, it started to be cool to wear tighter clothes. <laughs> like, so Jim were- Jones was already wear, but I was not on the trend. <laughs> I went to high school every day in sweatpants and a sweatshirt from Foot Locker with, like, <laughs> beat up Air Force Ones because, like, I was not going to do anything that was like popping in any way i didn't give a shit like i was just like oh i'm going God. to school i don't know how i got a girlfriend wait did you did you pass like gym yeah i passed <laughs> i like i passed classes i passed most of my classes through like understanding that like if i go a certain amount of times mm-hmm. and like 
this is not good for future employment, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> but, like, I passed basically by just, like, getting there and, like, whatever, right? Bullying so, teachers and <laughs> shoving them in lockers. I and- finessed, so I had Spanish class. And, like, I had finessed my way. I don't know a single word of Spanish. I finessed my way through, like, charming teachers <laughs> and being, like, cool <laughs> to getting 65s in every class, which is, like... In, in New York, they don't do, like, A, B, C, D. They do, like, 65, 75. Yeah, 65 is, like, that. that's the, like, the bare minimum. If you go below 65, it's a fail. Yeah. That type of shit. So. What did you get in your driver's test? <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny? Like, 64. <laughs> I learned to drive because I had driver's ed. And, like, the guy was a gym teacher. And he would just make us drive to, like, his house to go do errands <laughs> like that's what we would do that's a growth hack <laughs> he was growth hack he would be like all right you're gonna make a right over here you're gonna make a left now i'm gonna go inside real i gotta quick. go get some cigarettes just wait 20 minutes all right i'll be right back you learn how to put the blinkers on yeah. and i just sit there in the car <laughs> like all right and then we go to 7-eleven to get a slurpee i go back and then i pass driver's <laughs> That was Brooke. Anyway, yeah. so yeah. fucking um, yeah. I mean, like, I I knew I didn't want to do the stupid shit in high school, and like stupid shit me <laughs> classes. Like, classes. <laughs> and I remember like somebody uh came. It was like this high school, this like college recruiter for like Brooklyn College, and it was like all of these like bullet points of like what you could do, and literally none of them were interesting to me. I wanted to be in music. And I was looking at music schools, and I found out about Full Sail. And down I was in like, Florida. Down in Florida. And I was like, all right, perfect. Like, I'm going to Florida. I'm going to go live out there. Did so Full Sail know? <laughs> Not at the time. <laughs> we went out. We went out, and, like, we did, like, the whole tour of Full Sail. And, like... You and your parents. Yeah. Yeah. That's how they get you, bro. Like, they have, like, big paintings on the wall of, like a picture of a Grammy and a picture of an Oscar and they're all made up of the names of the Grammy award winners and the Oscar winners that went to the school. Uh And I saw that and I was like, Oh shit. And then like I was walking in, it was like huge studios, like all this stuff that I was like, and by the way, I didn't ever want to do any of this. Like I wanted (laughs) to be in the music business at this point. Right. But they had a music business class. You had to finish recording arts in order to get to it. So I was just like, all right, fuck it. Like, I'm here. Like, this is what I want to do. So at that point, it was like, I don't don't need fucking geometry or whatever. (laughs) (laughs) But so you get in. Anybody can get in. You just have to pay (laughs) an abnormal amount of money and, like, be in debt the rest of your life. Oh, cool. You know, God bless. (laughs) Yeah. It's worth it. Well, so you you get in there and, and you enroll and start taking classes? Yeah. I wanted to be in the music business. I didn't want to do recording art shit. Like, right. it was not really my interest. And I know, like, the basics of it now because I was there for a certain period of time. Eventually, what happens is they opened up this course called Entertainment Business. Mm-hmm. And, like, they allowed me to transfer my credits over so I could just do that. And I was in the first entertainment business class that they had there. Lucky the you. The first graduating class. It was just good timing. Yeah. But, like, um, first I tried to throw parties, and, like, I failed miserably. <laughs> just nobody showed up. Yeah, like, I didn't understand, like, marketing events at that point. I was just like, all right, well, we're going to get – and I, I met this guy. I forgot his name. Some DJ. So I went to this, like, networking event. And I met this guy who worked for this girl, Mercedes Streets. And I just wanted to work for Mercedes Streets. She was a street promoter out there. Mercedes Streets is like, you know how like uh, weathermen are just like, I'm like storm, like, you know, yeah. whatever. Like that yeah. sounds like. <laughs> and she, yo, Mercedes was like the street promoter out there. It was like a known thing <laughs> that if like you hired her to get your flyers out there, it was like the popping night or whatever. So this dude worked for her. And I was like, all right, this is my end. So I hit him. I was like, yo, let's throw parties. Let's do so- I just wanted to do something to get on. And, like, we did this party. He told me, like, all these ideas of how we could do this stuff. I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. So I was like, all right, cool. Ends up, like, nobody comes. That <laughs> night, I was pissed. And I through talking to this dude, I met Mercedes Street's assistant, 
who is like one of my best friends now. His name is um, Anthony McConnell, Mike. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or work. Yeah. 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 So like I literally leave that night pissed and I'm like, yo, I just want to work with you guys. Like I don't want to do this party promoter <laughs> shit. This is not what I do. He's like, all right, cool. Like come work with me. So like at 3 a.m., I'm passing out flyers. And like I guess he saw that like I wanted to just be there to like be on. He basically just put me on. I was working for Mercedes the next day. Like every morning, 3 a.m., club let out. I'm out there with the crackheads passing out like flyers, making sure people know like, yo, come to club, whatever the fuck it's called now. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, tequila Sundays, you know, oh, we got, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> first Thursdays, yeah. Dragon Room. That was one of the <laughs> Yo, but I mean, it's important to know that, like, you know, you're you're going through the things you don't want to do and figuring out, like, no, this is not for me. This is not for me. And that's all I ever did in my entire life. Growth hacking. Yeah. Growth hacking. <laughs> and Yo, also, that's what this episode should be called. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you should just not even my name. <laughs> just yeah. growth, growth hacking. <laughs> and let yo let outs were like, like I saw somebody get robbed on a let out, literally like at a little Boosie concert. Saw people like, and like, you're like, yo, when you get your money back come through on thursday (laughs) (laughs) the the night that the night that obama got elected into office i left my house after seeing it and went to go and everybody had these like clearly not made by the obama camp t-shirts about Obama, like his face on a stamp yeah 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 and like it was just like like it was just the wildest like Did you guys have an obama themed party that i'm sure somebody did yeah. obama thursday yeah. three before midnight <laughs> and all because all the clubs in orlando are on this place called orange avenue Except at that time, there was a place called Downtown. It was part of Disney, yeah. Downtown Disney, where you can go to the clubs over there. It's for but, like the adults. Yeah, yeah, like. Well, every club is for adults. Oh, that, <laughs> well, no, no. Mickey Mouse Club is not for adults. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. But they shut that down because they didn't want drunk people like intermingling. Yeah. And I was actually working at Disney, by the way. Wait, at wait, that wait, time. Wait, wait, yeah, wait, no, no. Now we're taking it back. <laughs> yeah. How did you get a job at Disney? Because you work at, or- if you live in Orlando and you need a job, you just work at Disney. And like, what were you doing? I sold toys at a store called um, Once Upon a Toy in downtown Disney. (laughs) They hated me. Who hated you? Like, the the people that were at Disney because, like, I was always, like, very, like... There's, like, a Disney way of doing things. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. And then there's an Alex way. (laughs) I would, like... I would, like... There would be, like, these trees of toys and I would hide in them. And then, like... (laughs) And I'd just jump out on people, like, Yo, you want a toy? And, like... (laughs) They would be like, Alex, this is not the Disney way. I would play with all the toys. They had like a build your own lightsaber station. Yep. And I would just like fight kids all the time. Like I'd be like, yo, kid, you suck. Here's a lightsaber. It's time. And we just start fighting in the middle and like it create this crowd. And in my mind, I'm like, yeah, this is me doing my job. And then every time, manager, no. Terrible. <laughs> One manager really liked me. Because I think it was because I was a football fan, mm-hmm. and like he was new, so like he like oh, and he also respected me because he was a Patriots fan and I was a Giants fan. Mm-hmm. And the first week of me working there, the Giants went to the Super Bowl. Yep. And I literally told him, "I'm not coming to work. The Giants <laughs> are in the Super Bowl." And like I think he just respected me for that. Did you ever go into like the um the tunnels beneath Disney? Yeah. Ah, oh, what's yeah. that like? It's weird. Yeah? <laughs> it's just like, it's it's all like, if you get like, they call it backstage. If you get backstage, it's really just like pallets of like all the crap that they're selling and like Mickey Mouse with his head off Whoa. or all that stuff. Disney as a whole is super like, Disney University is like a real thing. Yep. That's where you I train there. Honestly though, Wait, like. How did you, how'd you do with the university? I, I did really well, actually. Yeah. You know, honestly, like, even though I didn't like working in Disney, like... Or school. <laughs> <laughs> clearly, I'm just not <laughs> doing things that I'm... <laughs> At Disney, I was like, like, you really learn customer service and shit. Like, you learn, like, fan experience stuff. Like, every person that wants to be a manager in the music industry should probably work at Disney. For not a bad months. idea. They have a college thing most of their employees are college kids so yeah. like you well totally i mean the there. um 
the the day camp that we worked at were very fond of Disney yeah. just to begin with, and then they would start going like the leadership would start going down there. Yeah, for they these, do like, that. They train. Yeah. yeah, it's like not a game. Like to a T, they think everything through, and like ever since I left, like I always like you know make fun of it, but like. I kind of always had that mentality. Like, because after I left there, I worked at Macy's and got nothing from working at Macy's other than, Did like... Did you jump out of the clothing <laughs> racks? <Yeah. laughs> and fight customers you know with lightsabers? Nah, but we used to make fun of these guys. <laughs> the first day we were there, they have, they have, like, trained security. It's called, like, loss prevention. So there was, like, in... It's at this place called the Mall of Millennia in Orlando, and... They have a jail cell, like a holding cell, in the Macy's if people try to steal stuff. Whoa. And security, they did this whole lesson in the beginning. He was like, literally our first day, he's like, listen, if you hear footsteps on the ground, you get out of the way, okay? Because me and my team, we're coming. We'll knock you down. All right? We will take you down because we need to make sure that that $25 pair of cargo pants does not leave that store. And I was just dying. So we used to make jokes because they used to walk around. It's Orlando. It's like 90-degree weather. And they would walk around in hoodies and, like, their hoods up with glasses on. The most obvious, like, security guards. in, And when they would chase people, they would, like, do, like, covert things. <laughs> and they would pretend to talk. Like, I swear they were pretending to talk to people in, like, in their, their wrist. wrist yeah. Like, their wrist mic. Like, we got a 10-4 on the APB. And the so, like, we used to make jokes that they would hide in, like, the clothing racks. And you just see clothing racks chase people going down the thing. But, yeah, I don't know how we got on this table. Well, but, but how – okay, so so how quickly did you leave Full Sail? I was there for – like, this was all happening while I went to school. Like, I – while I was in school, I had, like, a girl – a very serious girlfriend that I would, like – halfway live with at her family's house that i'm sure they did not like me halfway <laughs> living there um and she lived like an hour away in this place called arbondale florida polk never, county florida you never heard of it yeah polk i only heard rick ross shout out polk county one time That's, and i was like rick ross is a legend yeah well sure anyways um so yeah like had a long-term girlfriend um, worked at Disney for like a year and a half and then worked at Macy's for another year and change. Um, went to Full Sail, was passing out flyers at 3 a.m. And then through Mike, I met I, this college radio chick who you guys know, Jesse McGuire. Yep. Sure. And I would intern for Jesse McGuire. You intern. I would ride around with her through Orlando during the day. And, like, we would just do shit. And, like, if she had to do an interview, I would come, hold the camera, stuff like that. Like That's wild. So that turns into me emailing these interviews to bloggers and stuff, like Nara Wright and Two Dope Boys. Because that's when, like, the blogger era started moving. And that's kind of, like, how I got my foot in the door for real. And then in between that, I was doing, like, super, like, stalker-esque music industry stuff. Like, like what? <laughs> I would be on, like, DigiWax because DigiWax gave you, like, all of the information for the people working the records. And I just got a BlackBerry. And I would just store, like, people's info. <laughs> and that's, like, and then, like, I would go on Twitter and follow them on Twitter and just wait for my moment. It was, like, the creep. So I met Al, but, like, that was the creepiest thing. What was the long-term goal at that point? Just, or was there one? It was like get my foot in the, like I remember telling my parents that like I was gonna come back to New York and apply for A and R jobs, but mm -hmm. like again had no fucking clue. Like my <laughs> experience did not count for a label at that time. So I was just like way I had no clue what I was talking about. At the time. <laughs> so it was just like, you know, I think at that point it was just like get my foot in the door, however I get my foot in the door. Um and we were doing a lot. Like I think with Jesse, that's when I'm met fki who's like producers mm -hmm. yep. that ended up like being like long time friends of mine um because they went to full sale yep um and like i just met a mike obviously who's now like the assistant program director of a radio station out in orlando and like you know i was meeting people that way and then wait can you just explain how anthony how his name is mike i have no clue 
Okay. I've actually, yo, if he's listening to this, <laughs> yeah. it needs real explanation and clarification because I have no fucking clue and I've always wanted to know that. Because I think that it's like McConnell and somebody was just like, oh, like Mick, Mike, like that sort of thing. Or maybe it's Anthony Michael McConnell. I think I think that's it. But like also like when I met him, everybody called him work. <laughs> oh yeah that too yeah so like but that was because they called him work because he would like literally Sell drugs. <laughs> yeah. no he that guy like literally would be he would drive up in a pickup truck with like all of mercedes flyers in the back and i'm sure mercedes was not probably paying him a lot of money at the time because like we were just trying to come up and he worked for the radio station at the time like power 95.3 is a radio station out there so he was working for the radio station basically being like a promo guy and then working for mercedes being a promo guy so he would be out in the streets of orlando from like morning to night every yeah. single day so just, that's why they call him work. two quick things about uh about him uh i always will get uh, messages from him at like Four o'clock in the morning. Nice. Um, and the other thing is, I always see him up here mm-hmm. doing work for like Hot ninety seven. So he um, he got a he had a job at Hot ninety seven, mm-hmm. and he lived out here for a couple of years, and then. But he would still like he would live down there and then fly he back. Left, and then, yeah. But again, to his name, because Summer Jam is such a big staple, he would like in he just even though he's getting a huge check, he would fly out on his own dime just to work Summer Jam. He's the best. Yeah. Yo, he is the most positive. Him and Matt Fastow compete for positivity every yeah. day. So, so, <laughs> it's a <fire. laughs> So, wait, how do you end up in Atlanta? Oh, so I had stopped working. That's a very long story, but I stopped working for Jesse McGuire. And I thought, like, my whole life was over. Like, I thought she knew everybody. Because at that time, I was a big Joe Budden fan. She knew like, Joe. This is Mood Music Three. Yeah. You know, like he's he's about to drop whatever. Yeah. I was a Joe Budden fan. I'm a blogger rap fan. Yeah. So like she would come out here and would know people. And she knew Just Blaze. And I was like, oh shit. This is <laughs> Just Blaze is the greatest producer of all time. So like um something happened. We just couldn't work together anymore. Um and I thought, like, my life was over. So I just started messaging people. Like, literally, MySpace. Again, I had this creepy index <laughs> of people. And also, like, I, through working with Jesse, like, I had this huge list of all of, like, the contact emails that I created from all these different blogs, like, big ones, small ones, whatever, that I had been using for years after that. Um, I just emailed everybody. And a couple people hit me back. I almost interned for Jordan Tower Films, but wow, I didn't, wow. I didn't have a camera. <laughs> um, so you didn't know what, that, what an A and R did anyway. So yeah. yeah, he emailed me and was like, he was like, "Yo, I'm down. You have a camera?" And I was like, "Nah, but I can borrow one." And then he never replied after that. I'd emailed like, "Nah, right." That was like, if I got on Smash, I was because from Box Ten Days, if I had worked with On Smash, I would like went crazy but that never worked i never told Hoff that story either i should probably tell him <laughs> today when i yeah. go back to the office yeah, yeah. yeah basically i'm linked up with this rapper nicholas f because i was a huge drake fan mm-hmm. and i started working his stuff on blogs and then through that i would go back to new york a lot and every time i'd go to new york to visit my family i would go with him and do like label runs or meet people or whatever and I built up a little resume doing that. And his manager at the time, H, worked in advertising. So I would get, like, small little ad checks from H. Like, I got to, like, blast out a clip from the Takers movie and stuff like Weird shit like that. But I had a cool resume because it said I was working with, like, Absolute Vodka and all yeah. this stuff. It's all how yeah. you how you free. Yeah. You know? So Al posts that he wants to work with. Um, he wants to start a blog. Al Lindstrom. Yeah, Al Lindstrom. Yeah. And I, because I knew him from the Digiwax stuff, I messaged him. We start talking. I'm in Orlando still finishing up school. At that point, I was like, all right, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start. I want to meet people in the music industry. Al knows everybody. We're going to make this blog like about music industry people. So that way I can meet music industry people. Smart. Yeah. But like it was also like 
whatever. At that time, I didn't realize it was like helpful for him because it positioned his brand as a person outside of being just a radio promoter and all that stuff. So first people you message is us. <laughs> yeah. No, oh. like really, like that's that's how we met, right? Uh, yeah, you came up here. You, you came and, over here to yeah. our apartment. Oh, no, no, no. That was... We had been doing that I, for a year. I, I feel like I met you guys. I definitely had met you guys beforehand. In fact, <laughs> when I first moved back to New York, I met you. I don't think I ever told you this story. I met you at Spin because I was interning at Jive, and some Jive artist had a thing at Spin. The, the, the ping, pong. ping pong place. Yeah. And I went to you and I was like, yo, I went to you. I was like, yo, I'm such a big fan. Like, I would, I know Jesse McGuire. I used to work with Jesse McGuire. And were they just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk to you later. And you were like, you were like, yeah, just email me. All right, douche. And then you walked away. So you're moving out here. I moved back to New York. I move. At this point, my parents don't have real space for me. So I'm just sleeping on their couch. Yeah. And um, isn't that like every like stuff? Oh, I was sleeping on the couch. <laughs> oh, my life was hard. <laughs> but um, I was yeah, I was sleeping on the couch and working with Al. I ended up working at Sirius at the time, like interning for Tony Touch's radio show. My first real radio show, actually, like a week or two before I had started, was when Exhibit C came out through Tony Touch's radio show. So, like, my first real job with them was, like, emailing blogs to tell them to incorporate that Tony Touch did it. <laughs> like, Al was like, yo, we need the credit, man. We need the- <laughs> all, by the way, as a disclaimer, all of my, like, interpretations of people sound like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah you yeah. do two voices. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, I need you to demonstrate. Okay, so uh, do um, Static Selecta. What are we talking about? <laughs> okay, now do um, a grandfather. <laughs> Oh, what are we doing? <laughs> do do Fleisch. <laughs> do f- oh man, young thug, you ruined everything. Oh. Logic, he's crazy. Do do um do uh, Waka Flocka's uh, former manager. Oh no, no, no. <laughs> Not doing that one. <laughs> um So now you're working at, you're working at Sirius and <laughs> You know, is is that something where you're like, I'm going to be in radio for the rest of my life? Nah, it was all like uh, just meeting people. Like I knew like I'd figured at that point, like the game was I needed to meet people. Yeah. You know what I mean? Relationships are everything. That was it. Like and on top of that, like I was interning at Jive and I was so I had the Jive thing. I was working for Al, which was a thing. And then Al was helping doing the marketing for Exhibit C. So Just Blaze wanted to start a label with Al. And I was, like, going to Stadium Red, putting him on the artist. And, like, that's how me and Just became cool. And, like, yeah, like, I was doing a lot. By the way, I mean, with all due respect to Jesse McGuire and the Orlando scene, Going to Stadium Red and hanging out with Just Blaze must Way have been bigger. mind blowing. It was I, at that point I was like, "Yo," and like the fact that like he would want my opinion on artists, and I sent like a bunch of art. The biggest thing I ever did with him was like, as far as like notable thing, was I linked him and Mac Miller, and they did that record together. That's dope. But um, and by the way, uh, and you know, people know that that Just is a good friend of ours. Yeah. What's amazing about him is that if he respects you, like, the respect goes both ways. It's, yeah. It's- I also felt like, because I was young and, like, way too, like, excited, he was like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Calm it down. Because <laughs> he was at this point where, like, he was, he he had just started going back into DJing. And, like, he was doing the, it was with Alchemist. He did a tour with Alchemist. Yeah, yeah, yeah where they yeah, were the going battles, back to back, yeah. yeah. So, like... I would chase him around because I because he wanted to sign XV at the time, and like I Man. I was talking to XV every day like Yo, we're gonna make this happen again. No clue at the time what the fuck I'm doing. XV just, was from like, Kansas. Yeah, or something? Kansas. Yeah. He's a good guy, man. Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah. It kind of like made sense. I could see why I just wanted to do it because like XV was like kind of in the talk for the XXL freshman thing. Mm-hmm. He never got it. I don't think. No. But like he was like on the precipice at the yeah. time mm-hmm. he was good to to us and like i have one i have one xv song and um let me just see who's Sci- on it oh yeah i yeah, yeah. had a prince and, Omen produced and it. aaron 
Christine. And Omen produced that. Omen produced that. That was like, made at Stadium how, Red. How, like, blog era is that? Yeah. It's very, very 2008. <laughs> but, like, I was doing all this stuff, and, like, I was super excited, and FKI became, like, really good friends of mine, like, first from FKI and Rich. And they put me onto this kid named Jace from 2-9. Mm-hmm. But at time, at this time, I don't think 2-9 was real. So it was called Retro... It was just him and Siege, and they were called Retro Sushi. Retro Sushi. Yeah. With and the, Yeah, with yeah. the yeah. So Siege was, like, known as, quote-unquote, the white boy of the A <laughs> at the time. And that's how they probably knew him. Because he would, like, at 16, he was probably, like, hosting club parties and all this stuff. He was in a Travis Porter video. <laughs> Uh, I forgot which record it was, but he played one of the mem- They It was a video where they had three white kids pretend to be the members of Travis Porter, and he was one of the members. I so like, that video, yeah. It was like a big thing. So Jace was like this rapper's rapper. And like me and Jace just, he was from New York, so he was living in New York in Long Island. And like it, like it took me like six months to get in touch with him. But, like, when I got in touch with him, I was just like, yo, man, I just want to help you out. I'm working with Just Blaze. I'm doing this radio thing. Again, leverage. Of course. And, like, he would come over my house. And, like, he would literally just write in front of me till, like, 6 in the morning. We'd just talk about music shit. We'd do it, like, once a week, twice a week, something like that. Um, I'd bring him up to Sirius, satellite radio, and, like, just have him hang out. In an, this is in an unofficial capacity. Yeah, like... Cause you gotta do, like, I really feel like when you're young, like you gotta do it that way. Like I still like, if, if you wanted to be a manager without like a real resume or like real real connections to somebody big, like you gotta like work it out. Like I was talking to PNB Rocks manager last week, and he's like picking up new clients and stuff like that for New Lane Entertainment. Does he want the guy who edits together Cameron? Uh, and- <laughs> 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 Cameron and uh, Biggie or whatever, <laughs> and Jay, yeah. yeah. That guy's name is the DJ Full Effect on Twitter, by the way. DJ it's Full my, Effect, I yeah. Think he follows us. He he might. He's my guy. His name's Tony. Okay. Um, <laughs> Anthony, Mike, <laughs> Tony, DJ Full Effect, yeah. Tony Cruz. Yeah. Um. Anyway, so um. So once or twice a week, he's coming yeah, over. Yeah, he's your coming place. over. We're working on stuff. Like he I, does follow us. Yeah. <laughs> so shout out to DJ Full Effect. Yeah. He, he, like, Jace was just, like, a cool dude. And, like, I saw it, like, right away. And he was sending me unfinished records. And then, like, what happened was he was, I think he was getting kicked out of his mom's house because he didn't want to work there anymore in, in New York anymore. So his dad lived in Atlanta. So he was moving back to Atlanta. And I was like, all right, well, I guess I got to go to Atlanta now. So full time? Nah, nah. This oh. is at this time. I'm like, I had this like crazy hotel hookup throughout. So like, I was staying at the W for like, and and Al was paying me. So like, I had a job. Like it wasn't like I was just like yeah, yeah, inter- yeah. like. So Al was paying me, and I would go, you know, once a month to Atlanta, stay at like the fanciest of hotels for the cheapest of prices, like the W downtown for like 60 bucks a night, something like that. Wait, I don't want to like blow up his spot, but how, how did that deal work? Uh, Afterwards, I'll I'll give you the plug. Yeah. It's a widely known plug, but like, I'll give you the plug. (laughs) Cause I feel like a dope, like I'm paying like full price for all these. (laughs) Yeah. I'll put you in. Okay. So like, I'll go out there and Jace and then this kid Damien who used to be a part of 2-9 would come by and like they were literally record in my hotel room and like jump around and like go crazy and then like I remember like I met Kurt Curtis Williams he came by that way and like I mean they were already 2-9 at this point you were recording in your hotel room yeah and they this used was to- like watch the throne before watch the throne <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was honestly it was because like we saw drake would do it with 40 and it was just like oh yeah this is they got great acoustics in hotel <laughs> you're like i went to full sail i know how to engineer like so, <laughs> so damien would come by like whatever and they had a store they had like a real store in um this kid Fani, who's like now original Fani on twitter he's 
dope dude. He had a store in Little Five Points in Atlanta in like this like offshoot area and I would just go that we would go there during the day, hang out with him. Fani was like 19 with a store and like <laughs> selling uh Cremo clothes, which is like B-Rights thing. Yeah, yeah that's B-Right. And he had his own line, original Fani. I have like one of those original Fani t-shirts somewhere, wow. like one of the original ones. And like we would just go there and they were already moving. And like at this point, I didn't know anybody else was involved with these kids except for Fani. Like, cause I would just go down and hang out with Jace and they would bring me around and I would like, I was at like the early beer and tacos days when it was like fucking and like a hole in the wall. And like, I remember DJ drama came one time. It was like a big deal and like shit like that. Um, and do you feel, do you feel like you're a part of something at that point? Cause you know, yeah. Cause like Atlanta at that time and like, I'm not, I was like around Atlanta at that time. I wasn't like in it in it for real but like atlanta at that time was like it was this whole there's like a hipster scene and i remember it was like little five was like supposed to be the central point to it and like there had been all these like rappers that had come before and um yeah like tukey carter was a part of it he was in that group i can't remember the name and like um Grip Plies, rest in peace, was a part of it, even though he wasn't like a hipster rapper. He was still like part of the culture of it. And there was a lot of them. Um, Dream Go Dreamer and and um Spree Wilson. Yeah, yeah. Like a lot of them. Was so, Sadia throwing her parties down there? So at that point, no, because um her parties were called Broken Bougie. Mm-hmm. That like that's what like beer and tacos was like the next Broken Boozy. Bro, she had already moved to New York. I didn't know Fadi at the time, but, like, she had already left New York. But, like, it was a thing. Like, you knew, everybody knew Broken Boozy. That was kind of, like, that scene's, like, coming out party, in a sense. If, like, you really go back into it. Um, they would go. I remember, like, because I was friends with them on, like, Facebook and shit. All of them would have, like, the broken boozy photo shoots that because they would do a f- different type of photo shoot every month you dress up a different way so i was Again, wondering you, what it was. very ahead of their time yeah did you just dress up in 5x <laughs> <laughs> at this point i was you know i toned it down a little bit you know i was newly single i was trying to like you know like, get out here i see i see what jim jones was doing yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> let me get the head hard you know? how never many skulls that. can i put on my shirt <laughs> never never um i would go out there and all that stuff was happening and I would go between that, I would between hanging out with them, I'd go to the studio with FKI and they were just starting to like really, really move because they first was Travis Porter's engineer at the time and then like the next time I came, he actually had like all the Travis Porter records and they were out like I, I forgot all the names but like any Travis Porter song that became like a national thing mm-hmm. first produced and, and FKI produced so and like and then like Iggy Azalea and then like uh, yeah, Post Malone and I mean that all came later yeah, yeah, like no, I'm saying like the growth of them yeah but like, like literally every time hacking. Ev- yeah. yeah every time I would come back to Atlanta it felt like it went from he was just an engineer to Oh, now he's got all these hits to now Travis Porter's getting their own studio and he's working (laughs) out of their own studio to then he had his own studio and he had like a whole different management team and like all this stuff. Like he literally would just like every month it seemed like it was just like shit was moving. So, I I mean, that was my friend. So I just go hang out with them and like kick it. But yeah, that's how I started going to Atlanta. And then like eventually afterwards... I started realizing what two nine was for real, and it wasn't just Jace. And I'd met Key Sandra at the yep. time, and I was like, "Yo, we should just partner up and work together on this." And still, didn't really know Meezy at the time. I'd met B Right once or twice, but like, didn't really know B Right. And and obviously, Dez was with B Right at the time. And like, me and Key were just like, "Yeah, let's do it." So I would. I just gave up at that point and was like on like the other shit for the most part. I would go do serious and book things, but I'd 
go to Atlanta for like months at a time. And and, and, and Key was on the management side. B Ray was on the management side. Yeah, yeah, we all like. I don't think we worked well together, but like <laughs> we all figured out how to do it. It would be like B Right, me, Key, Sandra, and Meezy, and then Dez was a part of it at, through B Right, and then Fani was always a part of it because he was like the creative director. Like he understood that side of things. We all kind of came from different. Like B Right was working with Kurt. Mm-hmm. And Meezy was working with Siege. And I, me and Key were working with Jason Key. And, like, Be Right then starts working with Fat Kids. And it was just kind of, like, a little divided. So we it, it took a lot to figure out, like, how to make it work. Eventually, the way, like, it came about was I was like, yo, I'll, like, I would throw marketing ideas. I would try to always do this stuff and, like it didn't necessarily come across every time. So I was just like, all right, my end is I'm gonna be the road manager. So I would just go to Atlanta and I would, we'd rent the 15 passenger van with like 20 people in it and I would just drive it. And like, that was it. I knew that was my play. So I stayed out there for the progress of it. And yeah. So you learned Atlanta like, yeah, eventually, like, I had, eventually I'd spend enough time there, and, like, when you hang out with, like, Meezy, who's, like, the king of Atlanta, like, literally, like, he, Meezy's super young, I don't think people know how young he is, he's super young, but, like, he was already, like, the party promoter for, like, the 18 and up clubs, like, he had, like, 4,000 kids going to Mansion Elon at, like, 20 years old, like, he was doing everything, he was buying his mom a house, a car, like, he holy cow so Meezy was like that dude and me and Meezy like became really good friends because like it's not if you're not friends with Meezy I don't know what's going on <laughs> like he's just like the most likable dude in the world so like we would just drive around and like he would show me shit and then I'd be I'd call Meezy and be like yo we're working this record for key it was called guess who I was like let's go to the club and Meezy would set up all these club things that we would just pop up at all strip clubs. By the way, being broke at a strip club is the most depressing thing in the world. <laughs> what about broken bougie? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's basically what it, it's like. You sit there and like the girls come by and they say, oh, you want to <laughs> dance? And then by the fifth time you say no, you realize that all the strippers have talked to each other in the back. <laughs> and they're like, see that white guy over there? He fucking sucks. <laughs> so I knew I sucked. And like, I was going to be depressed in the corridor. And, like, I didn't have a ton of money at the time. So, like, when I was there, I would end up staying. Um, I would live with FKI in their studio and, um, like, sleep how I could sleep and stuff like that. When did you first learn about Future? When I was going out in Atlanta. The crazy thing was when I was – it was the days when I would go to the hotels and, like, Future um, had a live stream and, like, on Ustream. Yeah. And it had like 50, 60,000 people on it. And then the next week, I came back to New York and watched the live stream of Summer Jam. And it had 30,000 people on it. And I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> this guy is bigger than a whole concert. <laughs> and yeah, like, I, I think it was like Dirty Sprite era was when I liked Future. And like, but it was shit like that. Like, Trouble was big to us. And really, just like, what's crazy is, is like, they were all like, easy going kids like they would just do like whatever they could but like it wasn't like they were like that right but like that music because it's atlanta was everything so right. future gucci like any of that shit you come back to new york and it's everybody like, thought what? i was crazy like it was like i came back i was like yo this future shit's crazy all my friends were like this shit's whack b <laughs> Those same people, by the way. Oh, yeah. Every single one of them Biggest Future fans mind. now, right? Yeah. It's the same thing with, like, Thug. Like, I told everybody. They were like, nah, it's just whack. I remember... You know what's funny? I told the dude OG Johnny 5 about... OG Johnny 5 on Yeah, Twitter. on mm-hmm. Twitter. And I told him about it, and he was just like, I don't know. I'll check it out. I will see it. <laughs> and now, like, he talks about it, like, every day, and I was like, yeah. <laughs> see? Open minds. Well, there were there were a few times when you would go on Twitter and like go find your original tweets, being like, "This guy is me." The next. You, yeah. I never found my own tweets. You absolutely did. You found those tweets. Maybe I did. Maybe I did. Yeah. I don't go look for those things. <laughs> Maybe I did. <laughs> yeah, nah, I would never do that. I think you're right. I think I think I did that. But um, so also <laughs> at the time, my bad. 
or am I good? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it looks good for me. I'm just you saying. Went, you went down to um to some studios and and you would sleep in the studio. Yeah, FKI studio. Like I would live with FKI. So who who would come through? Everybody. Like it would just be like it's always like the most random ones that are funny, but like the new boys were there. The, uh, well, LA. one one yeah. of the new boys came and like that was a weird thing. And then like. I remember DJ Smalls was there at one point. By the way, shockingly short. <laughs> <laughs> and he was doing interviews and stuff. And But the one is is Dro. Young Dro <laughs> used to work out of the studio. Because it it's like a complex. It's yeah. This guy, B. Rich, owns the whole complex. And like, B. Rich, who is um, B.O.B.'s man. Yeah, yeah. So, like, and he hated that I slept there. <laughs> and, like, he would, like, like, and he was always nice about it because he knew, like, so, I, like, God bless. Like, it's not my place. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> but like, he would really, cause I would sleep on the couch in like the like main lobby area. And like, he would just be pissed because like he would see me on the cameras. Anyway, so wait, like, wait, wait, the main lobby area. So when people walked in, you're the first thing that they would get yeah, knocked the out on the couch at like 2 a.m. Cause 2 a.m. is a general time for some sleep. <laughs> well, but like, not in a studio. Yeah. <laughs> But, like, yeah, like, I would knock out and, like, fucking, you know. <laughs> anyway, so, like, weird shit. Like, I would fall asleep and then, like, Young Dro would come, like, not wake me to flight. He just walked in the room and go, what's that in here? <laughs> <laughs> I was, like, scared out of my mind. And I was like, oh, shit, you're Young Dro. <laughs> and it's 5 a.m. and I'm, like, half asleep. And he's like, hey, let me sleep over there. <laughs> And I'm on a couch, so I was just like, okay, young Dro. So I literally <laughs> get up and walk to a different place. Like, shit like that would happen all the time. After Atlanta, you come back to New York. Yeah, because – so the 2-9 stuff, they were about to be signed. And, like, at a certain point, I just kind of realized, like, I didn't work well with, like – I didn't work well with, like – the people that were coming in and signing him, basically. Right, right. And, you know, I was young, and I thought I knew more than I did. And, like, I thought that, like, I was not trying to – I was stubborn. And I was not trying to, like, just get down and, like, be a part of the right, overall – Right, to play your role. Yeah, I wasn't trying to do that. I was yeah. like, we are not. We don't need to sign. Like, we could do this independently. And I had been doing content deals for Al – so I understood kind of how like online monetization worked. Like at that point, I was working with Al and I built his YouTube channel where we had Static Show and Tony Show, and then we were sending people to do interviews with different people in the music industry and monetizing the videos so he would get money coming in. And then like on top of that, we did a deal with Vivo, so we were able to do an original content for them, and we had money coming in. And I understood it. And I was just trying to, like, preach it to them. Like, yo, we could do these. I remember, like, I put me and Key were trying to get them to do a deal with in-groups. Like, 80, 20, like, non-exclusives. Like, and, like, we were like, why don't we do this? But they were like, nah, these guys want to give us money and they want to do this stuff. And, like, we could really go. And they're, like, 21 year old some of them had kids some of them like all of them were homeless at this point when we go down there i'd sleep at fki studio jace would sleep there like a lot of people that i ended up meeting like mike boy jr he yeah. would be there all the time with rome fortune and like rome fortune would work out of like somebody else's studio they would sleep there like it kind of became this like thing where you would see all these folks, J Dirt, like all these people that I ended up being friends with for a long time. And like, I just couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't be homeless in Atlanta. I couldn't not work and get money. And like, I didn't want to have like a boss at yeah. the time. Like I didn't want to like work for somebody doing all this stuff. Like I knew what I, I knew early on, like that was my mentality. But, like, obviously it changed. Yeah, but, like, right, yeah. but, like, at that point, I'm like, yeah, I want to do this myself. So I just was like, nah, I called Jace. I I literally spent my last money on a plane ticket back to New York. And then I got to New York, and I called Jace. And I said, after, because I saw the deal, and I was just like, yo, I don't want to be a part of this. And I called Meezy, and I was like, yo, Meezy, please, like, just 
you know, I don't want to be a part of this. Talk with Jace, whatever. I told everybody involved. And that was it. And I was just kind of like, I can't do this shit anymore. I don't want to do this shit. And, you know, within a month, I I had known this guy, Benner Hall, from he was working with Reese, who was a part of 2-9. And I was just like, yo, I don't want to do this, like, blog shit anymore. Like, I don't want to, like, I want to level up, basically. And he's like, all right, well, I'm talking to this dude, John Masters, and he has this company called Same Plate. And, like, maybe we do everything and we do the Same Plate stuff. I was like, all right, cool. And then within, like, a month, I was working, like, a Rich Homie Kwan, my type of way, doing, like, digital marketing. And, like, that was it. Like I'll be in, I was good. And for anybody who doesn't know, Benner is behind Henny Palooza. Yeah, he co-owns Henny Palooza, and John works at Empire. Is that? But uh, also has like he uh, manages uh, Illmind. Yeah, yeah, has a very rich history and yeah, been around for a long time. Yeah, John manages Illmind and co-owns, um, not co-owns. He uh, is the head of A and R for. Empire. You spend your last money on a plane ticket back to New York. Yeah. You to go back live with my parents. Which right. I'm not to happy. go to go back and live with your parents. You you have in your mind some sort of expertise in terms of marketing. You have a good sense of like what you think can work, and you don't want a boss. I like relationships. I mean, I didn't. It's not that like I didn't want a boss like. I didn't want to do something that I thought was independent and have it not be independent. You know what I mean? I like deep down I always wanted like a mentor or like something like that. And I guess Al was really my mentor like early on and then like I had like mentors from afar beyond Al. Like I would look at like G and hip hop and like idolize like I fucking like since college like idolize them never met them I just told you I saw a hip hop in the <laughs> elevator one time I got nervous um Lior Jimmy like like basically like any of like really G like hip hop since 1978 and then what became Blueprint Group was mm-hmm. like to me the greatest thing of all time cause like they weren't a label it wasn't like and I eventually learned more about the music industry and like other people but like they were just like it. So I followed their steps. And to me, they were like always independent kind of. And they always. So I was just like, that's what I want to do. I always want to kind of be independent. But you yeah. went to work for Hot New Hip Hop. Well, I was working. So I went to work for Same Plate. Yeah, right. You're right. Because um, that was John's company. And through that, I had done a lot of marketing. John met Sorrow, the owner of Hot New Hip Hop. They're based in Montreal, so he was downtown. And they were building an office in New York, and they wanted to make this, like, a big hub. So they, the short story of it is, is as they're building the place, they're hiring people, and they wanted somebody that was an artist relations manager, somebody that could get artists in the door, could negotiate, like, you know, premiere deals or sponsorship deals or stuff like that. And John put me up for it, and I never had a – real job at that point i was like 23 24 at that point and i was just like yeah i want to do that what are you crazy i'll go to the office every single day so like i was part-time doing the same plate stuff and then during the day i was doing stuff i actually got the job because chance the rapper came to Sirius and played um this record like he gave al because he's friends with al Mm -hmm. he gave him an exclusive it was like him and then like a snippet of j cole Mm -hmm. and al's like we gotta clip that and do this because we always did that ever since exhibit c and i was like yo i'm gonna put it on my soundcloud i made a (laughs) soundcloud called bald god sounds and like uploaded it and then it went crazy and then the next day sorrow emailed me like ha 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 i see your picture on it (laughs) And that was it. Like I got the job at that point. Did you tell every all the blogs that credit me? Yeah, <laughs> Tony nah. Touch had premiered it. <laughs> um, as the director of of artist relations, were you a director? Or? I don't know. All right, whatever. Uh, yeah. Artist relations manager. Was you were the, title. the president of artist relations. Yeah, the CEO. The CEO of being a boss. My yeah. my favorite uh, artist 
visit that you made happen. Oh, I forgot about. <laughs> yeah, was the one and only Ether Boy. Oh yeah, Ron Browse. So yeah, all right. So <laughs> to start the job at High New Hip Hop, you got to go to Montreal because you got to meet the Montreal team for some reason. So you know to he, figure out who you're working with. Yeah. But he made us drive to Montreal. He didn't fly us out. He was just like, "Yo." Rent a car, drive up, six hour drive. This is you in the flesh? Me in the flesh. What are you listening to in the car? A lot of shit. At that <laughs> point, we were just listening to whatever was done. And like, we were having fun. Like, it was a great drive. I would not let Justin drive because he <laughs> drives so fucking slow. It's ridiculous. And I still won't let him drive. Like, it's so annoying how slow he drives. Um, but on the way, I'm like, how do we make a splash? I'm like, we got to bring New York back. <laughs> and I remember, and my thing about Atlanta was, was no matter what the street culture was, like no matter what the culture of the music was, dancing was always a part of it. So like Future like would make beef it up music. Like you go to the club and like any Future record would hit, Tony Montana would hit, everybody would beef it up. And I was like, yo, you know what? That's what we need to do in New York. We need to bring back dance culture, have fun again. Everybody's too many of these bars. Like, we just need records. How do we do this? And I'm in Montreal, and I'm like, we're going to bring back Ron Brown. <laughs> <laughs> I knew because he has so many hits. He got five hits. I've counted them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, like, I'm messaging everybody. And then um, Juliet, who works with Just Blaze, put me in touch with him. <laughs> and the week we get back... <laughs> I'm like, yo, we got to set up an artist meeting. So Ron Browse comes up. He's got his hype man with him. <laughs> and Ron Browse starts playing all these records. He had like 12 records in the stash. Brand new. Brand new. Yeah. And he was like, give, like, he basically just explained that like, you know, this was his comeback. And like, it was time to bring back this type of music. And I'm hyped up because I'm like, <laughs> yeah, Ron Browse, that's what I'm talking about. You guys are on the same page. Exactly. Yeah. And fucking, so he starts playing. He starts playing these records, and like, the hype man is just dancing in the corner. My, mind you, like, there's we're in construction. Like, there's like the plastic down to make walls. The tables are all fold out tables. It's me. It's sorrow. It's like Rose who runs High New Hip Hop now, and Justin, and we're all sitting there. He's playing records on like this fucking boombox that we bought <laughs> from Best Buy just to have this moment, and like he's playing records, and like just like yeah, that's my jam. And then he goes, his hype man goes, you see, every record what we do is we make a dance with it. So this is what we're doing. And then he's like, wipe your face, and like it's like a ten step dance. <laughs> She's doing this whole dance, and I'm like, "All right, this is this is interesting." You're like, "I see it." And Justin's yeah. <laughs> having, and so I'm talking to Ron Browse, and Justin's having this side conversation. And I guess, like, at one point, the guy goes to Justin. He's like, "Yo, you know what sets me apart from every other hype man in the world?" <laughs> and he's like, "What?" He's like, "All these hype men have whistles, <laughs> but I got an official NBA referee whistle." <laughs> But I forgot it in the car. <laughs> so I'm just going to do the parts. And then he just starts going, hoo all the rap the songs. And we're just sitting there like, all right, this is the greatest thing I've ever dealt with in my life. <laughs> and it was like the greatest moment I've ever had in, in, in music industry history. I've invited Ron Browse to my birthday every year since. How many has he responded to? Zero. <laughs> yeah. And just flat ignores me. And it's really sad because like... I, like I'm not trying to make a joke of it. Ron Browse to me it would be my best friend. Yo, every every time there's a big party, Henny Palooza or whatever, you're like, yo. Oh, I told Cam, <laughs> Benner, Rory, and I've worked Henny Paloozas to help Benner out. Yeah, and told them every single time. Bring out Ron you Browse. are insane, and yeah. they're insane. Do you realize? Like, think of it this way. <laughs> There's 5,000 kids, right, mm -hmm. at, at Webster Hall or yeah. whatever they're going to yeah, do yeah, the next yeah, one. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, lights go down <laughs> and freaking boom, 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 boom. <laughs> and then Ether Boy. You know how fucking crazy the crowd's going to go? Nobody's going to expect that you shit. You not only said to to all the Henny Palooza guys to do that, you told us that any it's the real show. Oh, it's yeah. a mistake if we don't have Ron Browse. You need Ron Browse. I'm really Wait, going hard for Ron Browse. You want him to open with A-Rab money? With, no, no, no. That That's um, 
That's pop champagne. Pop champagne. <laughs> he got to come out to the big one. <laughs> yeah. And then he got to do a rap money or do jumping out the window. Do you yeah. see it, Jeff? Oh no! Now I see the vision. <laughs> Bro, I'm, I'm fucking with the movement. Because, like, nobody would expect it. I'm so serious about this. Right. Nobody would expect that. That's the thing about, like, I get so sick with shows where, like, like, I was talking about OVO Fest this year, and I was like, like, he's going to just bring, like, I knew some of the people he was bringing out. You didn't know Nelly. Nelly, I didn't know. Nelly's a power move. But that's the shit that you, like, a- after you go to 10 OVO Fest, it's like, how do you just surprise people? Right. Right. And, like, you can't bring out Jay-Z every year. I'm sorry. Right. He's the greatest. Yeah. You can't. Well, why not? Because it's just... <laughs> it's not a surprise. Like, like, literally the first one, I always thought this. When they did the first one, he brought out Jay-Z and Eminem. And I was like, well, what the fuck are you going to do now? <laughs> like, After Hot New Hip Hop, you go to Atlantic Records, and yeah. you work in digital marketing. And one of the first events that you were... Uh, one of the first big events that you were a part of... Yeah was well can you explain how how you made this this 99 cent store thing oh yeah in reality so i was working santi gold's project and tumblr had this whole meeting with us and it it just like i was like yo that's it well because the project was called 99 cents right and i was like yo that's it that's what we need to do for santi's album like done (laughs) so I set up this meeting with Tumblr and Santi, and we went and kind of just brainstormed because they have this series called the IRL series, which is like events that they help put on. Right. So I knew I wanted a big event for her because it's New York and she's such a big New York artist. And like that was the play. And like we came up with this huge idea. Like it's a website. It's hard to explain, but if you go to like her website, you can still see it now. And like in it, the idea is is that we're commercializing every record. Like we're basically making fake stores and all this stuff. So that was when Sa- Santi's like literally a genius. Like you, I'm telling you, like not just the child genius, the most yeah grown yeah. genius. <laughs> She's the most creative person that you'll ever meet in your life. Like literally to the point where I th- like I tell people a story all the time where like. Her album packaging has like yellow in it, so they sent her a picture of the album packaging. Like they sent like a PDF version of it. She's like, "Great, that's the yellow I want. Now, can you make a copy of that so you can mail it to me, so I can have a physical one to make sure that the yellow is right in the physical." Smart. Like that's the level of creativity that she's at, and like being like a perfectionist. And she wanted to do a ninety-nine cent store, so. Nick Harvey, God bless his soul. He's like the greatest human being ever. He is. I've said that ten times already, but <laughs> he is. But like, he's he literally called every nine ninety nine cent store in all of like Manhattan and Brooklyn. Nobody wanted to take on the liability, and fucking of having a live like show. Oh yeah, there's huge the liability. Store. Somebody slips, like we steal. Somebody steals shit, sure, like yeah. all this stuff. Well, if somebody steals shit. Then you just got to get the people from Macy's. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> should have hired them. <laughs> you always make it come full circle. Um, Jack's 99 cent store is like the biggest 99 cent store in the world. In the world. It, it's a three That's floor. That's how they n- advertise it. Yeah. It is. That's how they say it. It's a three floor 99 cent store. It's on 32nd Street. And like he owns several other ones. But like he he had been talking to Jack and like he was like. Jack of Jack's 99 cent store. Jack of Jack's 99 cent store. <laughs> And I didn't really understand at the time how crazy Jack from Jack's uh, no, he's not was. crazy. He's creative, <laughs> child genius. Yeah. So basically, he kept saying that like he was talking to Jack, and Jack was like, he wants us to come up on the money, then come down on the money, <laughs> and like he wants to do it for fun, but at the same time, like he didn't know. So he's like, let's just have a meeting in the office. So the meeting was at like four o'clock. And, like, I never met Jack at this point. And I get a call from downstairs, like, um, Alex, it's, like, 1 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> Jack from Jack's 99 Cent Store is here. And I hear some yelling in the background. It's like, what the fuck is going on? I run upstairs, and Jack is there with, like, a bag of these things called stretchkins. And he's just yelling, oh, it's Jack from Jack's 99 Cent Store. Hey, baby, here is a toy. I'm here. I'm here for everything today. 
<laughs> and I was like, yo, Jack, what's up? It's Alex. I was emailing with you. I'm here to work on the project. Let's go away from Julie Greenwald's <laughs> office to like the room over there, like the conference room to go talk about everything. He's like, oh, you want to do that now? <laughs> And I was like, well, why did you come? He's like, oh, I want to have some fun. I'm here for fun. <laughs> By the way, the best way to make a good, a good first impression is to, you know, bring gifts. Yeah, bring gifts. Show up early, right? <laughs> he was there with his, like, business partner. We made his whole deck to sell him on coming down on the price. He looks at the deck. He literally picks it up. I don't think he flipped the page. He's like, all right, you tell me how much you want to do it for. Let's do it. He's like, you want to do it for whatever? Done. <laughs> All right, and his business partner is like, now let me tell you about Jack. Jack is the kindest man, the greatest man of all time. This man, let me tell you how beautiful of a man he is. And Jack's like, oh, stop it. Shut the fuck up. He's too much. This guy's too much. What are we doing here? Like, was By the way, you know what sets uh, Jack's uh, hype man apart from most other hype <laughs> <Yeah>. men? <laughs> Love the whistle in the car. <laughs> but like he, like the guy tried to do some business, and he picked up the deck. It was reading through it and trying to like figure something out. And Jack would tell him, "Just shut the fuck up. We're doing it. We're doing it. Don't even listen to this guy. We're doing this thing. It's done." Right. So like, he never look a gift horse in the face, right? Yeah. So Jack basically let us take over <laughs> his 99 cent store like literally reskin the whole thing like but didn't he tell you didn't jack tell you or or was it his business partner they were like this is such a great idea like we're with it oh yeah <laughs> this is the greatest thing i've ever seen what we're gonna do is we're gonna do one here we're gonna do one in miami <laughs> we're gonna franchise the whole thing you're gonna we're gonna take jack's 99 cent store and do one of these across the country and go global <laughs> And then freaking Jack was like, Jack was like, what are you crazy? We're not doing that. You don't listen to this guy at all. You know what we're doing? We're doing this one. All right. Shut the fuck up. Like he's like whispering. At, and by the way, they're being like totally friendly every time he tells him to shut the fuck up. But he would like verbatim be like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> Let's have some fun. <laughs> So he let you take over his store. Did anyone slip and fall? Did anybody? Uh... Nobody slipped and fall, but he slipped and fell. But um, he was actually cool with people stealing stuff. Cool with why? Wait, why am I finding this out now? Yeah. <laughs> oh, people were like, like I don't like I don't know if you noticed, but like it was open bar, but like people would just steal like drinks and pour. Yeah, like did not notice that. Yeah. Oh, you want to know what I did notice? I that. would be a terrible. I saw. Guard. I saw. Um, I saw people running towards the back and like, <laughs> yeah, I saw like people eating chips. He was cool with it. Like, yeah. <laughs> I saw um, Don Monique, yeah, the rapper from Brooklyn, mm -hmm. dope rapper. She was like taking like like different like cupcakes and stuff. I was like, yo, go for it, bro. Yeah, because <laughs> that was the that was the point of the party. Like, so the idea of it, the inspiration behind the party, honestly, was that um, Santi went to some event it was like a fashion week event at a white castle and the owner of white castle showed up they were giving out free white castle the whole night yeah and like it was literally just a party at a white castle they didn't even dress it up yeah and the owner of white castle was there everybody's drinking and the owner gets on the table and goes we're tonight we are going to raid the castle <laughs> and she thought it was the greatest party ever so like she wanted to do it. So, like, Jack was the perfect partner. Like, let him steal shit. He didn't care. Like, literally, when we did the walkthrough, he would steal his own shit and just <laughs> give it to us. He'd be like, he'd grab a bag of candy. Hey, you want some candy? Here you go. Here you go. <laughs> we would be forced to eat, like, the worst candy. At Atlantic, you worked with Meek on a project. You worked with Cardi. You worked with um, Kodak Black. Yeah. P &B. P &B Rock. I did Gucci, Hamilton. Um, oh, that was another big one, too. A lot of plaques. A lot of plaques I can't afford. You were down. You were down. <laughs> you were down in Atlanta. You returned to Atlanta for uh, the Gucci for, show. For I Gucci's set up the, big show. Yeah, but it went it went amazingly. Yeah, that like event. the that was great. I did like a full twenty four hours there. I was not trying to. Right. Like now that like, I, I'm not trying to party as much anymore. So I'm like, unless there's something, if there's something for me to do, then like I'll go out there and and I'm always down to not sleep. You know what I mean? But mm -hmm. like. I'm Tell not that down. To be rich. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, <laughs> I'm always down to not sleep, but like I'm not down to like 
spend three days for a <laughs> one day trip. Like, it's right. just not, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. fly me in, fly me out. Yep. Well, um, you're a father now. Yeah. Well, I wasn't a father then, but yeah. like, same thing. Yeah. yeah. You, had a, um, you had a father mentality. You had a bald dad mentality. Yeah. As soon as I lost the hair. It was, uh, now that you've worked in the music industry, was yeah. it everything that you hoped it would be? Was it? Yeah. I feel like, honestly, I feel like my time at Atlantic was like college. And I said it to like new hires that we were like doing the interviews with. It was just like, because like but prior to that with Same Plate, I had worked on projects. The, like I worked on Jeezy albums and like the closest thing was Logic. Like, Logic, yeah. Yeah, I did a lot of stuff with Logic's first album. And like that was like when you're an outside hire working on stuff, it's always kind of like piecemealed. Like they don't fully give you the project. It's all, you're not like in the inner circle of the project. But Logic's team, and this is why we're friends to this day, like – we were in the inner so like we were working on logic we they would come in town i would stay at the i mean and sleep at the hotel but like we would be at the hotel every morning leave every night we went above and beyond i actually just went in my dms and saw that i hit og ron c to try to get og ron c to go to a logic show like random shit that i would never do for a client i was like going above and beyond for yeah. it. and like benner was and john was too um but like yeah like you don't get that experience any other time and like when you work in it you're in that that's why i don't ever like debate rap shit anymore because like dudes who debate like rap sales or like debate like oh well this first week number or whatever they don't understand like 95 percent of the stuff they just look at like the base level thing that happened they'll never know that like an artist didn't want to do things or like that in the process of this happening, somebody got fired right. or like something leaked accidentally and like, or budgets were like, they'll never understand like that until you're in it. Yeah. So that's what it was. I was at Atlantic and I was in it like for real, for real. And like the first project they gave me was Jill Scott and like woman to woman. It was, it was called woman. Oh, just woman. Woman. Yeah. 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 Woman to woman is a 1970s soul song. <laughs> But that's but that, and you guys did a, a thing uptown. Yeah, yeah. But like, my job was in events. My job was like making sure like shit was done online. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. So I worked with a you know a bunch of people and did like a bunch of dope internet things and fucking yeah. Can you talk about what sixteen thirty three is and what the mentality is and what was accomplished in in a short period of time? We realized that Atlantic has for the majority. Um, outside of a couple labels, um, the dopest up and coming art like Uzi, Kodak, PMB Rock, a Boogie, like Hamilton, <laughs> Cardi B, Cardi yeah. B, and then we had you know we got Gucci, which is like the fucking godfather of all of yeah. it, and like you know all that type of stuff. So we knew what we had, Kyle. Like yeah, we knew what we had there, and. So we were doing a event at South by this past South by Southwest. And that's kind of, it was Julie's idea to call it 16. Well, initially we were thinking of calling the event 1633 and then maybe I forgot what it was named, but Julie was like, yo, that's a dope lifestyle brand name. And like, that's what it needs to be. And like Julie comes from the Def Jam era. So she mm -hmm. understands that mentality and like, that was it. So that's what 1633 became. It's like a lifestyle offshoot of Atlantic in a sense. And like, you know, Marsh St. Hubert is really like who, I, you know, I look at it as like a mentor for the past two years. And hopefully she doesn't just excommunicate me <laughs> now that I'm not there anymore. But like, you know, like Marsha and and Ashley Kalmanowitz, who is your best friends, mm -hmm. and and Jason, like they took the lead on uh, it. Jason is also it. our best friend. Is he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, they took the lead on it. We just we would do dope shit. So we did a big South by concert with Gucci and Meek and and, and all of the other people and U Uzi and. and no, Eric wants you Cardi to say B. who hosted it. Oh, you guys hosted it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't go to it, so that's why I don't really remember. Again, in and out. It's okay. It was it. it was it was live streamed on title, but you know, yeah. whatever. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. It was live streamed on title. Yeah, it was. I didn't yeah. Know. Oh yeah, it was. Yeah, because they trotted us out in between every act to be like, Thank you, title. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. And new era hats and uh, Oh like, god. If you're gonna have a host come out and like come out between every single act to be like, Hey, thank you to the sponsor. 
don't have 45 acts on stage because <laughs> Eric and I were out there every five minutes and the, the crowd hated it. You know what? Like, is what it is. We did um, a Kodak Black film with World Star and then a whole movie premiere for it. Um, we did a whole TV show with BET during BET Awards weekend. You did, did those uh, uh, opening ceremony jackets. We did jackets with opening ceremony. We've done, we did th- like an event, like a listening event with Genius, which now Genius is just doing like, did a bunch of stuff. Right. That was the Wale one that you yeah. guys did. We did a bunch of stuff and like, they got more coming. Like, I, I like, cause I'm not working there. I don't want to like say it, but right. like, there's more coming and like, you know, I, what's funny is, is like what I noticed is because Jordan Chalmers, who's in the digital department, really wanted to drive social. And like he's done a really great job at building that out through partnering with 20 million influencers and like all of that stuff. And like I, I honestly think what it kind of has become is our way of navigating the influencer waters a little bit without um having to put it's not heavy-handed yeah Yeah, it's not like atlantic records is doing this atlantic Records is doing that i mean it is atlantic records like we don't hide it but at the same time it's not like you're not gonna get like the stupid shit you know what i mean you're gonna get like grade a cream of the crop this is what you want in like an event or something like that. Right. I started working on PMB Rock. Right. It was really great. And it was a super success story in the label. And I'm really proud of it. It's probably the most proud thing I am. I, I, did I say that right? I don't no, know. but you didn't <laughs> finish high yeah, school yeah, or college. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah. So I went to Philly to go shoot a video, um, with the Fleisch. Yeah. And, it was for a record called New Day. Video's never coming out. Okay. Um, so don't ask that's, me. That's not part of the marketing plan right there. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, we went down there, and, like, I wanted to do something that was, like, because the song's called New Day, and, like, he's basically, like, there's, like, I don't know if people realize there's a real, like, new music scene coming out of Philly with Uzi, with PNB, like, all the new Meek stuff, Maddox, like, becoming a thing there's like this kid pound sign pop that's really starting to buzz out there Hmm. like there's really and then like molly raw is a producer like it kind of to me feels reminiscent of not atlanta when i was there but like because i also had spent a lot of time in toronto on like the early days of toronto and like when drake had come out and like so you think that matt ox is like drake (laughs) no i think i think like it's as a scene reminiscent to like there's a big guy in Lil Uzi Vert and yep. a big guy in Meek Mill right now and a big guy now in PNB Rock. And like there's a lot of up and coming talent that's a part of it somehow. And like I'm seeing it's not really about the artist, but I'm seeing how like Mont PNB's manager is moving or like um his partner i forgot his name or like um i'm seeing how meek's team is moving out there and they're very it's all entrepreneurial it's all fucking like i want to drive this thing and like make philly a scene when you say it's more like houston no okay i mean i (laughs) i don't really know like the houston scene like that like and then, like, if you're talking about the era of, like, Mike Jones and Yeah, Paul Wall, well, I just mean, like, all these guys who are very entrepreneurial on their own. You have a couple of big names, and then they all sort of, like, it just becomes, like, a thing. Like, it just, like, yeah. sort of pops off. Well, I didn't, like, so that side, I was, I was like, 15, 16 when that was happening. But, like, with Toronto, like, OVO was a thing from the jump. Like, if you were in Toronto. XO, they had an XO. It was, like, a brand. They had their own store. Yeah. Like, that's how I met Omari Shakir, who was, used to be a part of EXO. Like, they literally had their own, like, vintage clothing shop. And then in the back was um, this, like, private club where they shot the Marvin's Room video, I think it was. And I had met The Weeknd. Like, that was the shit. And if you look at all the names in Toronto now that are coming out, it's all from, like, those early seated entrepreneurial days of, like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to build a brand. And, like... It's the same shit in Philly. Like, it seems like you got New Lane and Dream Chasers and, like, you know, 
Uzi stuff. I don't I don't know if there's a name to it, but like that's there. And you got the OGs now. Anyways, so all in all, I'm going out there to Philly, right? <laughs> Let's just fast forward <laughs> to this thing because I got to do some things. Yeah. So I'm going out to Philly, and I wanted to show the new side of Philadelphia. So I start doing research, and somebody puts me onto this group called the Dollar Boys. <laughs> and um, they're dancers in Philly. They're like kid dancers. By the way, Matt Ox was in the Dollar Boys. What? He's the Dollar Boy? He was. I don't know if he still is. Can you ever? I don't think you ever leave the Dollar yeah. Boys. I don't know. I'm a Dollar Boy now. So Once like, a Dollar Boy, a always do- a Dollar Boy. As a Dollar Boy, I just want to like let everybody know that I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> All right? So. Because I get. <laughs> so we meet up with them in the projects in Philly. And. I'm like, all right, this is kind of, I've never met this guy before. I don't really know what the Dollar Boys is at the time. I'm like, it's kind of fishy. Like, we're running and gunning on this thing. So I am I go to the McDonald's across the street, and I'm like, yo, I'm at the McDonald's across the street. Just let me know where I got to go. Or just come here. And he's like, all right, pull up. He pulls up in a pickup truck with 10 kids in it. <laughs> and then there's an Escalade behind it with another 10 kids in it. And I'm like, all right, this is interesting. So he goes, meet us here. Follow him in. <laughs> we're in the courtyard in the projects. And as we're walking in, I see all the kids run by me. And then out of nowhere, the song New Day starts blasting. <laughs> like, like, from, like from the rooftops. Like, like it's just like it's it's this this it's so loud. It it literally sounded like it was like amphitheater speakers, like fucking like a festival stage was right next to me. So I turn around and he had festival stage speakers <laughs> in his pickup truck with a generator to power up. And they just run and start dancing. And like I start seeing people like coming out and getting mad and like I'm seeing people get angry. And he just runs up to one of the doors, and this old man is pissed. And I'm like, all right, so he's going to call the cops. Like, well, He's going to shut the whole thing down. So I tell him, like, yo. And he goes, runs over, comes back. And I was like, was it good? Like, He's like, yo, we're the dollar boys. We're good everywhere in Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> At that point, I wanted to be a dollar boy, and I, I got jumped in, and like, I'm, I'm in the dollar boys. You're now. good anywhere. Yeah. yeah, anywhere. And the last one we did was for Meek. With the, uh, the the bike life meetup, yeah, yeah, wins and losses. Did you bike? Wins. I <laughs> proposed to my girlfriend that weekend, so <laughs> I was not there. But that was a win. That was a big win. It was a win. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Okay. Congratulations but, to you guys. Thank you. But so it was dope. Okay, this is what we in the podcasting world call an edit. We recorded this episode back at the end of summer 2017, and it was at this point in the episode that Alex gave us a little insight into leaving Atlantic Records and joining Universal Republic as their director of digital marketing, a great step up in title and responsibility. The idea was that we'd air this episode later on in the year when he was more established at Republic. And for five months, Alex did his thing until the perfect work situation, moving another couple of rungs up the ladder came into his life. And this morning, as he announced that he was leaving Universal Republic, we grabbed breakfast with Alex to get a general sense of what he's up to starting today. (laughs) Okay, here's what I can say. One, me, Jeff, and Eric are at Eisenberg's right now, which should give you a clue of a location. If you know, you know. No, me and a friend are working on something very top secret around this location um, that will be somewhat of a predictable announce, but at the same time, we're doing things in a non-traditional way. Um, It's going to be different. Um, I think it's something that I'm super proud of because it's an issue that I saw happen over and over and over again while working at the major labels and it's my and my friends attempt at trying to solve that problem and move us a little bit faster in the industry to where we should be or where we think we should be so yeah that's kind of the details i guess but i don't know if you want to ask something or am i just going to keep ranting 
you say this is going to move things faster. Is it the Uber of the record industry? Yes. <laughs> no, wait. Are you an Uber driver? <laughs> <laughs> That's the, that is actually where we're going. Me and my partner have invested heavily in one car. It's a coupe. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff said it's a coupe. I don't know if you could hear over the delicious Eisenberg meals getting made. Um, no, it, yeah, I don't know. Is it the Uber of of the record industry? Yeah, why not? Yeah, no, it's the Lyft. <laughs> Fuck Uber. Yeah. They, I owe them four hundred and fifty dollars, and I'll never pay them. Who? Podcast number two, you get that story. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, we wanted to congratulate you on not just making it in the music business, but making it on your own terms. It's pretty amazing. Appreciate Is it too it. late for you to get a diploma from Mickey Mouse University? <laughs> I, I think I have one. Because I got in your office. I definitely, definitely. Yo, so I can't afford plaques, by the way. <laughs> yeah, but how plaque, much are they? Like They're like 350 four, or something? 350, 500 bucks. That, depending. That's, a, that's, that's a great problem to have. It depends how <laughs> nice the plaque is. And like, you know, God bless Atlantic. Like, I'm and streaming. I'm racking up on plaques you I have, can't afford. You have done so <laughs> much good so, work. <laughs> so like, so like. I keep thinking of what am I going to hang in my office, especially now that I'm going into a new office. And I'm just like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to like get like hang my di- like a doctor. Yeah. I'm going to hang like my full sale degree, <laughs> high school diploma from James Madison. <laughs> like fucking the Mickey Mouse thing if I could ever find that. Yeah, by the way, better than your old office, which had just a like crack, yeah, 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 crack in the wall and nails. And uh, nails that were just bare, like nothing uh, on them. Because I'm like never in my office. Like, I just go to other How places. are we always in your office? <laughs> yeah, it's true. You probably have been in my office 20 times and I would. Yeah. At least. And just dropped off, like, amazing gifts. Yeah. Well. You guys are, like, real promo gods. I just want you to know. <laughs> like, real, like... Our promo game is really good. It's A1. Like our, our t-shirts are really good. A1. Yeah. Yeah. Listen. It's just non-stop. You know, uh, now that you'll have a, a new office, we're going to come knocking on your door. Yeah, please. So, I won't. We're just going to go hunt your old office. <laughs> I think, I think, um, I wonder who they're, I keep thinking who they're going to give it an office to, and if they're going to realize there's that huge crack that's been there <laughs> since I've been there. Like, I, I hope somebody knows that. Right. For the benefit of, like, the building yeah. stability. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you have, you have, you have left your mark on the last record. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't me. I didn't make the crack. <laughs> It was there when I got there, I swear to God. Oh, man. <laughs> Alex, thanks so much for coming through. Thank you very much. Thanks to everyone for listening to this new episode of A Waste of Time with It's The Real. Jeff, people want to find out more about us. I'm Eric. You're Jeff. We are It's The Real. If people want to find out more about this podcast, it's called A Waste of Time with It's The Real. If people want to find out where they can go and get tickets for our upcoming show this Wednesday at SOB's here in New York City, our live podcast live from that legendary stage where 2 Chains and John Legend and Kanye West and Drake and so many more have hit. Where can they go? To get tickets to all of our upcoming live performances, including our show at SOBs, go to itsthereal.com, I-T-S-T-H-E-R-E-A-L, no apostrophes, no spaces. If you want to listen to any of our podcasts, all of our old episodes, all of our new episodes, you can go to iTunes, search for A Waste of Time with It's The Real. We are also on SoundCloud.com slash A Waste of Time. You can also find our episodes on all streaming services, including, and this is a big one, this is a new one, we are now on Stitcher. It has taken us a year to fix our RSS feed, but we are there, and we are happy to be there. Shout out to Will from Stitcher, who answered my email and made it happen in like 20 minutes. Should you want to listen to our music? I hope so. I would hope so too. It's on all streaming services. Go to stream Teddy Bear Fresh by It's The Real. We are on Spotify. We are on Apple Music. We are on Pandora, Tidal, all streaming services. It is there. We have our song Sugar High featuring Currency and Smoke Dizzle, which is at 550,000 plays on Spotify. If you want to find us on Instagram, we are at It's The Real. If you want to find us at Twitter, at it's the real facebook at it's the real we are also on snapchat at it's it's the real and twitch at it's the real it's the real 
but we haven't used Twitch and we barely use Snapchat. So if you want to find us there, we're there, but you know, it's sort of a whack follow. Also, I do want to mention Jeff did say Sugar High featuring Currency and Smoke Dizzy at 550,000 plays on Spotify. It's not quite there yet. It's almost there. But you guys should take it over. Let's go for 550,000 and make Jeff correct. Let's round up this year. That's right. Jeff, we are tired of being the underdog. So the goal this year is to get on everyone's radar. And we know it starts with us. So we want to shout out people who can then spread the word about A Waste of Time with It's The Real. Who do you want to shout? I want to shout out two guys. But more specifically, I want to shout out one guy who wants to shout out another guy. So I want to shout out DJ Don B D M V on Twitter goes as Teflon Don, and he said that he wanted us to shout out Soulful Mike, who is just a guy who loves sneakers, music, and sports, according to his Twitter bio. He's from the Bronx. I don't know too much about him, but shout out to Soulful Mike. I want to shout out Jeff, our friend Justin Fleischer, the Fleisch, who we talked most recently on when we merged our Instagram lives. And we did a session there where we were in New York and he was down there in Orlando and he said that he's on his way up to New York City very soon. Shout out to Justin Fleischer who's been on the road for a very long time with Logic and was super excited that this episode was shown the light of day because he is a big Bald God fan. And we are all fans of the Fleisch. Shout out to the Fleisch. Shout out to the Fleisch. Guys, this Wednesday, January 10th, we will be live on stage at SOB's here in New York City. Go get your tickets right now. If you are from New York City, we expect you to be there. It is our biggest market, our best market, our favorite market. Shout out to everybody who already got their tickets. Shout out to everybody who's going to get their tickets right now at itsthereal.com. Not for real, for real. Sure, sure. See you guys next week. Brrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr